Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Throughout today's call, we will be pausing for question and answer sessions. At that time, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by pressing star, then one, on your phone. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd now like to turn the call over to Leland Milstein. Thanks very much, and thanks to everyone for being with us today for the Thursday webcast series by Alliance for Community Trees. The Thursday webcast series is a bi-monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two model organizations' methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives. Each for 10 to 15 minutes, by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. This session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF, one CFE Category 1. If you haven't already given me your certification number, just email me after the session, and we can make sure you get your credits. Most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which ACT can provide to anyone who would like one. So, again, email me after the session if you need one of those. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees. Please consider joining if you're not already a member. And I want to thank today our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service, and our presenters, Barrett and Greg. Today's session is Species Selection, Part 1, Nursery Selection. Tree selection does not end with choosing the appropriate species or cultivar for the planting site. Suitable nursery stock must be chosen based on planting site conditions and intended aftercare, which should dictate maximum tree size of planting, root ball characteristics, appropriate tree production method, and tree structure. Choosing good quality tree stock is about increased survival rates, quicker establishment, and better integration with the landscape. Especially in places subject to heavy wind, rain, and snow, choosing good quality tree stock reduces the likelihood of failure from structural defects. Here to tell us a little more about that today is Barrett Robinson, who joined New York Restoration Project in 2007 and is responsible for managing the design process for the organization's 55 community gardens and individual park renovation projects, working with renowned landscape architects and designers from across the country. In addition, Barrett oversees NYRP's procurement for all horticultural and construction materials and selects landscape contractors for NYRP's Capital and Million Trees NYC-affiliated projects. Before joining NYRP, Barrett worked in garden design and project management in New York City and was responsible for project cost analysis, scheduling, site management, and materials procurement. Prior to that, he held positions of increasing responsibility at a number of landscape service companies specializing in sourcing and procurement, and he also uh, was an independent designer and installer in and around the Columbus, Ohio area. Barrett attended Ohio State University, where he majored in agribusiness and minored in marketing. He also attended the ATI Extension of Ohio State, where he majored in landscape design and construction, so he has lots of experience in today's topic. Thanks so much for being with us today, Barrett. Thank you. So today's a great topic um, and something that I really get excited about is, um, you know, I think a lot of us work in the, the tree industry and um, do a lot of planting community-wise and, and in our cities. Um, and we really come to learn that, you know, the right tree, right place is important, but also selecting the best tree you can puts you way ahead of the curve when it comes to survivability and, um, you know, long-term health of a tree. So we prepared some slides of different things that we found from, you know, a lot of time that we spend out in nurseries all over the country and just looking at, you know, great trees and poor trees and trees in the middle and, you know, things to look out for when procuring trees because oftentimes you're using other people's money and you really are looking out for the long-term benefit of the city that you're working in. So I'll just kind of go through some of those things today. Um, There? Yeah, there we go. Okay. The slides are just taking a second to warm up. The um, so why select a high quality tree? Um, obviously, to minimize you know factors that can lead to transplant failure, you know, mitigating maintenance costs, and and again setting the tree up for a long and healthy life. Uh, this slide in particular shows a 
uh, a linden that we planted on a New York City Housing Authority campus with those fantastic volunteers shown in that picture. And, you know, some things to notice about the tree. Um, the, the, um, just the shape of the tree itself, the, the branching structure, the straightness of the trunk, even though it's being pulled a little bit. Um, planting depth is a, a very important thing to consider. Um, and, you know, in this, in these property types we plant, maintenance is limited. So again, putting the right tree in, um, that's the healthiest tree, gets, gets you a lot further. You always want to look for, you know, no crossing branches, no wounds in the trunk, a good central leader, um, and a 60 to 70 percent live crown ratio, which, you know, help trees caliper faster and, and stand up straighter without a stake, which is, you know, really important uh, cost-wise, but also for safety depending on where you're planting. Um, next is the nursery visit. Um, and things to look for at the nurseries when you go tagging. Um, I think familiarizing yourself at the beginning with the ANLA standards is very important because they also include the ANSI standards, but really are the, the things that nurseries should be working from um, on the day-to-day -day and, and making sure they follow those standards because that's an accepted industry, um, industry standard. Um, field maintenance is a big part. You really want to just walk through and make sure that they're taking care of the fields, that they're free of weeds, there aren't any major uh, pests that you see, there's not a lot of, you know, wildlife other than, you know, birds and positive things. You don't want to see ground chuck holes all over the place or, you know, a lot of deer browse damage or things of that nature. So it looks like they're controlling um, the environment with those trees are, are taken care of. Um, and our rule is kind of, you know, if they are taking good care of their trees and their fields, that means that not only the trees healthy, but they're going to take good care of you and they're going to pay attention to detail, um, which is all a part and, uh, important part of the partnership you form with the nursery. Um, field knowledge, you know, that they understand their soil types, that they understand, you know, their region and the rain and moisture rates, and, you know, that really plays a big part in what trees they can grow in that region and grow well for that matter. So um, important to understand those things in the beginning so that you can pick the right nursery to satisfy your tree needs. Um, because sometimes people grow trees in very warm or very cold climates. They may not acclimate in your climate. Just trying to understand and, and learn that piece of it is important. Um, and you're developing a partnership with that nursery because hopefully it's a long-term uh, relationship that you have with them. And you also want to be able to communicate with them not only about the good things they're doing but the things that they could do better. Um, and also if you have a problem that you can call them and say, hey, I have an issue here with these particular trees. You know, just so that they'll, they'll listen and be receptive because you have that trust and that, and that bond. Um, steering clear a few things, the used car salesman technique, the, sometimes there's bait and switch that goes on. You know, they don't want you to necessarily look, you know, too deeply into things. They want to glaze over the top and show you all the best stuff without showing you the, you know, the nuts and bolts that you really need to see. Um, tree species surplus liquidation is another one. You know, if somebody says, oh, you know, I, I have, all these amazing red maples, you have to ask yourself, why do you have so many red maples? Is it because they're not selling? Is there a problem with the tree? You know, did you, there could be a lot of things that, to, to think about. So I always get, if someone is really too eager to push something on me, I'm always a little hesitant about it. Um, and then just understanding what the market is for the materials you're purchasing, because oftentimes, you know, they may have a species in particular that they want to upcharge a lot more for, but the reality is the liner on that tree doesn't cost any more than, than another one. So just understanding that so you can buy, uh, buy smarter is really the key, especially if you're purchasing in volume. You have a lot of control and opportunity in the purchasing process. Um, next is container versus B&B. I'm sure this could be a whole webinar in itself. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of benefits and challenges or pros and cons with these different variety, different different types of trees. Um, you know, a bunch of the pros for containers is they're easy to move, lightweight, they can be handled by volunteers, they're easier to unload off of a truck, um, usually by a person as opposed to a machine. They're available any time of year, so if you have an early planting that needs to happen and you can maintain them well, you can always have those available and you don't have to worry about fall dig hazards or having taken them too early in the spring or, you know, a lot of the things associated with field-grown material. Um, some of the cons, you know, circling of roots is a huge issue and there's a whole bunch of slides going forward that we can, that'll show more examples of that. You really have to be careful about what containers you're buying. There's a, 
very specific cycle about upshifting, um, and that has to be followed very, very stringently. Otherwise, you're planting a problem tree um, that might look okay now, but 10 years from now will 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 be in trouble. Um, and then also, you know, a containerized tree is traditionally on a drip system and fertilized regularly, so those trees are babied. And if you take them out of that container and plant them in the ground, they don't have a lot of maintenance. Um, they're needy, so they may flag much more easily. They may have dieback. There may be some issues. So you know, you have to tend to those trees a little bit more because they've been babied in nursery. Um, concerning B and B trees, um, superior root structure in a lot of ways because those lateral roots can really spread out. Um, when they're dug with machine, those roots are cut, um, and as long as they're not buried too deep when they dig them, you know, it's actually good to root prune them in that way so that you get additional flush of, of roots. Um, they retain water much better a transplant because the original soils that they were in, um, but they're a lot heavier and they're more difficult to move and they need to be dug during certain periods. Uh, and there's some trees that do much better growing in a container than they do in the field and they transplant much, much better um, uh, from a container than they do in, in the ground, Nyssa, Savatica being one. It's almost impossible to do in, in certain seasons to dig where in a container, if you can get them, they, they do really well. So just understanding the different species and the different needs they have um, as trees so that you can make sure you get the, the best tree in the best package that you're looking for. Um, just some examples of, you know, container growing. If you look, uh, the slide, the photo on the left uh, looks like a little metasequoia, you know, just showing how the liners are grown, whether it's seed or tissue culture or cloned. Um, just making sure that you understand where those liners came from and that they use the highest quality liner in stock so that your end product is, um, what you want it to be, which is a very healthy, very uh, stable tree. And that picture on the right is just, you know, kind of the end of the cycle, 15-gallon uh, containerized. Those are Liriodendron. And, again, this is a good shot of what a good field maintenance practice is. You can see all the trees are staked with a, 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 um, with a stake that doesn't necessarily harm or hold the tree. In pl um, it doesn't allow the, the, the wind to beat that tree back and forth and damage it. You know, keeping the fields nice and clear and clean of weeds, you can tell that most of the weeds are out of the pots. So really a good example of a great nursery where they've taken care of the trees and you can see the consistent pruning all the way through so that you, you know, you can just run down the rows and tag any of the trees you want because you know they're all very consistent. Uh, just another shot of uh, nursery out in Oregon. You can see how advanced you can get with, um, you know, structures and buildings to make sure that the climate and temperature is right for those trees and the watering. But really amazing if you could if you could possibly count how many trees are in, you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of trees there. And to think that they start that way and they end up to us as a final product in a much larger capacity five or seven years later. Uh, mycorrhiza, just something I want to touch on briefly. Um, the white fuzz, the symbiotic association between a fungus and the roots of vascular plants, basically like uh, the, the, the hair on your arm. It's much harder to dry the hair on your arm because it retains a lot more moisture, and a similar thing happens in the ground um, that bonds to that root mass and allows it to spread out further to collect more moisture. So it effectively is a natural way to help that tree get more water. Um, it's found naturally in the woods in a lot of different places. Um, but if it could be added at the beginning of the cycle when these trees start, it, re it remains in that soil throughout and expands, so you're already getting a tree with that mycorrhiza. If that doesn't happen, and you can ask about it, but if it doesn't happen, we always recommend adding that to it, planting to improve your soil health. Um, so back to the containers and the roots and, and root circling. Uh, as you can see in that picture, um, that is, a, I think, a 25-gallon container, and you can see there's a, a three-gallon shape pot physically inside that soil. Uh, and you can see those encircling roots that are going around, and, and what that shows is when that, when that tree was potted up from a smaller container to a larger container, it had spent way too much time in that smaller container, and the, tr the, the, the roots are, are encircling and girdling that tree. So over time, that tree is a dead tree and not something you ever want to buy. Um, and here's an example of that. So you can see where that smaller container is inside the bigger container. We pulled it out, shook all the soil off, and that's what it really is. So those roots never made it out of that encircling package. Um, so if you were to buy that tree, you're going to pay for all that dirt with no roots in it. Um, and really what you're buying is the roots. Obviously, you want to pay attention to the top of the tree, but that's where your money is because that's going to keep the tree alive and, and help it grow uh, throughout time and keep it in place so it doesn't fall over and is less susceptible to disease. Um, 
call it pop in the hood, but we spend a lot of time taking pop off of uh, trees in the nursery. Some nurserymen get a little nervous when you do this and they don't like it, but at the end of the day, you're the customer, so we always recommend that you do that. The one on the left, you can see that you just have some fibrous roots starting to hit that outside edge, um, which is a good indication that it's about the right place for that tree. The one that's in the worst category, I would probably pass on that tree just because it's almost a little, it's almost too far along. Those roots are still semi-fibrous, so there's ways to shave that off at planting time to salvage that tree. Um, but if you could avoid something that far along, that's really the end of the cycle, in our opinion, of when that tree would be viable for purchase. Um, just some more examples of those pots inside pots, and you can see the one on the left that's a gigantic root that is, you know, encircling there. That that tree's a goner. That'll never get past that point. And as that root continues to get bigger, it'll choke out the tree. And another example on the right of a pot in a pot. Um, and timing is everything with the containers. Um, we like these days for a tree to be field grown, air rooted, root pruned heavy, and then put back in a container and let grow for a year. Um, it eliminates a lot of that encircling, and you have a tougher tree because it grew in a more difficult environment um, to start with. And then also, you know that somebody has seen the roots, so you hope that they select the tree that um, is best based on its rooting. So this, in particular, this tree should have been left in that container for probably another six to eight months and given a chance to root out. The problem is, if you go to plant that tree, you're going to pull it out in the, uh, that pot the way it is, and most of that soil is going to fall off. And if it doesn't fall off, you're going to put it in the ground, and there's nothing to hold that tree up straight. So you definitely have to stake it. Otherwise, it's going to blow over in a matter of days, um, and that tree would be a goner unless you really kept an eye on it. Um, air pots, something maybe older, maybe newer, but I've seen it more recently, but keeps roots from encircling because they grow through those little holes, and as soon as they hit the air, they burn off, so it forces that tree to continue to push more roots out and actually fill that whole container with roots that are not in a circle but forcing out. Um, good to ask if they were air pots that anywhere in the cycle of when you buy those trees. Um, just again, you know, roots are obviously the most important. So you want a tree that doesn't have lopsided roots, J roots, one side or the other. You want a really full, nice root package. Um, photo credit to J. Frank Schmidt and Son. We were out for a conference out there, and they actually had a really fun demo for everybody to take a look at all these bare root trees and pick the ones that had deficiencies and how they would grade them and um, just a demonstration of what, you know, what they look like or what they could look like and how a nurseryman should grade their trees, um, which was a very fun activity. Um, then just comparing field grown to, to bare root trees, um, you know, pull them out of the ground, bare root them, making sure that there is that root structure you need. Again, nurserymen don't necessarily love it when you destroy their trees. Keep that in mind. But if you're going to buy a bunch, it's normal to ask to see that. And it's a good test because sometimes nurserymen don't know. That's something definitely to look for and to try. Just a good photo. If you look at all those honey locusts, they're just little saplings. And there's, a, there's some oak in there and some sweet gum too, I think. But a good contrast between the mature forest behind it and the beginnings of a forest in front of it. Another good example of Zelkova, just clean rows. These are all limbed up because they're going to be street trees at some point, but clean, consistent, even pruning, not a lot of weeds. Um, one thing to consider, though, if you look, you'll see the tops of these rows. Um, they went through and cultivated these uh, pathways in between to get a lot of the weeds and things out, and doing so sometimes throws soil up onto the root mass of the tree. You want to make sure that that root flare is um, at ground level or at site level because if they have soil piled up on top of that tree and they go in to dig it, they're going to now dig a much more shallow root ball compared to where the roots actually are and chop off a lot of those roots. So you want to make sure that that nursery has those root flares at the top before they dig it. Um, something definitely to, to keep an eye on when you're out looking at trees and at, at, at quality nurseries. Most of them should know if they're a good nursery and you can talk to them about it. and They'll, they'll, they'll be interested in hearing your questions and your comments. Um, we tag trees both in midsummer and in the winter. I think winter is good because you can see all the branching structure and really get a good feel about the shape of that tree. Um, often very, very cold and sometimes wet, but um, could be a very good time to, to go. And actually, that's a photo taken at Moon Nursery, but it's shocking if you look at the consistency of those trees as far as the eye can see. They're all the way down. Um, great for tagging large volumes of trees because you know they're all the same. So you can run down the lines and pick all the ones you want and be very selective about it. Also, again, digging into the soil to find that root flare is very important. You want to make sure that's at the top before you do any of your digging.
Um, again, just having a nurseryman shake off the soil from a tree. He was actually excited to do that in this photo. Um, but really checking to make sure the roots are great. Even if the top looks nice, if you don't have any roots on the bottom and it's dug, not dug correctly, um, you're not buying, you're not getting the value that you're purchasing because that tree is not going to have the jump start it needs to get going. Um, and then last, just some helpful resources. Um, Ed Gilman's got a, some great things about, about trees and actually something we just learned about containerized trees. Um, when planting them, pull them out of the pots and you plant them in the ground and once they're stable in the ground, you go around and basically shave the last two inches of the soil all the way around that ball, which would cut off any potentially encircling roots because those roots really want to grow laterally. So taking that shovel and just while it's in the ground, you know, chopping that all the way around, as long as you only do about two inches off the end, it's not going to hurt the tree and it's going to help you long term for that tree's health. Um, J. Frank Schmidt and Son, they have an outstanding catalog which shows uh, tree shape and, you know, really gives you a lot of information about the trees that you're buying before you purchase them. So it's a good reference, uh, reference material to have. And then if you have any questions about Million Trees and what we're doing here in New York, please check out our website at nyrp.org or milliontrees.nyc.org as they have a lot of good information about urban planting and techniques and volunteers and just a lot of different things we've learned in New York over, over the past couple of years working on the Million Tree Project. Great. Thanks so much, Barrett. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. So I think what we're going to do now is open up the lines for questions. So, Tom, if you want to tell people how we do that. Thank you very much. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by pressing star, then one on your phone. You'll be prompted to record your name so I may introduce your question. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, that is star, then one. One moment, please. I'd also like to remind people that you can if you don't want to talk over the phone, you can ask your question online using that Q&A tab at the top of the window. Uh, you can type in your question, and I will read it out over the phone. So that's an option as well. I want to get started, though, quickly. I have a question for you, Barrett. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just uh, a question about guidance you might have for folks uh, sort of in these, these tougher economic times, how to still get good quality trees for maybe uh, spending slightly less. Um, does that mean going for smaller trees is the best way to do it to still ensure that they're good quality? Yeah, I think, um, you know, depending on what your application is, you obviously want the right size tree. You know, for a street, you know, you need a larger tree that's going to be able to hold up um, to the conditions of that, whether it's, you know, neighborhoods or wind or vandalism or, or who knows, or cars bumping them. You know, you really got to pick the right size tree for the space. But, you know, if you're trying to save some money, um, I think that containerized trees are significantly cheaper um, because of there's a lot of front end money that goes into that, but um, on the back end they're, they're cheaper to purchase. So containers are a good option if you're if you're trying to be tight on budget. Um, but I think if you can talk to a nurseryman and understand how many cycles the trees have gone through transplanting. If you get a tree that's uh, been transplanted a few times and done well, but is a, a bit of a smaller tree, you know it's a safe bet. You can buy that smaller tree because it has the roots below that you're looking for because it may have been shaved or cut a couple of times. Um, and I think uh, just making sure if you pick the right tree, giving it an extra bit of TLC if it's a little smaller than what you like will get you the same result. So, um, again, I think picking the, the best nursery and really getting to know the nurseryman and where the material came from and what their maintenance practices are, um, you can go with a smaller tree that you know is going to be healthier and grows faster um, as opposed to buying a big, fancy tree that may be a lot more expensive and not knowing potentially what, uh, how it got to where it is today. Great. And you, you actually you mentioned uh, just now talking to the nurseryman, and maybe you could uh, speak briefly about sort of building a relationship with a, a nursery. I know that you guys at NYRP have done a great job with that. Uh, so maybe you have some advice uh, for other groups or smaller groups about how to just start up a, a good working relationship with a local nursery. Right. I think um, I think first and foremost, you have to talk to people who know about trees and share the same passion that, that we all do for them. Um, you know, I think asking a lot of technical questions and even asking them from the perspective of not knowing the answers shows that you're interested and shows that you want to learn. So allowing that nurseryman the opportunity to tell you about his product and, you know, really take pride in what he's doing and what they've accomplished um, because it's their family of trees, basically. You've shepherded that tree for so long. If you show that respect of what it took to get that tree to that point and what it takes to physically get it to you and, you know, working in the rain and dealing with drought and insects and all all the things that are so difficult 
um, it shows that you respect them and their profession and in turn will really respect what you're doing and go the extra mile to help you and to give you exactly what you need. Great. And actually related to that, a question that came in um, over the Internet is sort of how, what would you suggest uh, for working with a nursery successfully when you're at a long distance from that nursery and visiting isn't possible? This is a question from Alaska. Uh, yeah. So how do you avoid getting unacceptable trees, um, you know, if you're, you're far away? Right. I think that's a tough one. You know, I'm um – I'm a, I'm a window shopper, so I'm the type of person who likes to stick my hands in the dirt and really get a good feel for, um, for you know, what I'm getting and, and really interview the nurseryman basically. But, you know, if you're not able to travel because the distance is too far or the budget's not there to do it, um, I think really partnering up with um, a really good liner grower, you know, at the beginnings of the trees, they have a good handle on some of the best nurserymen. So working with them to figure out where they send a lot of their material to, where they've had a lot of success with the – the transplanting of those smaller trees um, gives you some indication of, you know, the quality of nursery that you'd be dealing with. Um, you know, and again, if you develop that partnership with your finished nursery that you're buying the trees from and really develop that level of respect, that will ensure that they send you the right material because sometimes if you call them over the phone and say, I need, you know, 10 maples, they'll just grab 10 that they need to get rid of um, because you're not going to take a look at them. So if you can develop that friendship and that partnership, you know, with them, so not only they respect the business relationship, but they respect you, they're going to want to give you the best product because they know you're going to continue to come back and they want to do business with you. Excellent. Do we have any questions over the phone? At this time, we've had – oh, excuse me, we just had one question come in the queue. One moment, please. Our question is from Blake Watkins. The line is now open. Hi. Um, we recently, this past winter, got some southern red oaks that had extremely, extremely weak trunks. Mm -hmm. um, and my question, I guess, is do you know what causes that? Is there any – are there any other species you know that have that problem, um, and is there any way we could have we could have seen those when they came in and known that that we were going to have problems with them? Well, and by weak trunks, do you mean that the trees were leaning over, basically bending in half, that they were not standing up on their own? Yeah, they had a bamboo stake on them when they came in. They were container trees. Um, we planted them. Um, we used volunteers, and a, a number of them had the bamboo stakes removed when they were planted. The root ball's upright, but the tree's laying on the ground. Yeah, I've definitely seen that a lot, and uh, one, there's a couple reasons that, that that could be. One is that they didn't prune the heads back enough so that, you know, that tree has been, and they've been, it's, it's growing as quickly as it can, but the head is too big on the tree, so you got to take off a bunch of that extra weight to keep it from leaning over, which will help with some of the problem, but... Mm -hmm. Um, we also find additionally that if you can find a nursery that takes the stakes off really early in the game, um, it allows that tree to stand up on its own and deal with that wind back and forth, strengthening the trunk of that tree. Um, a lot of times nurseries will have those trunk of those stakes on, so all those trees look perfectly straight, and that's a nice thing to see. Um, and there's actually a, a hormone in those bamboo stakes that causes the trees to grow away from it. And it all, additionally, at some early stages in the tree, they um, absorb uh, sunlight through the trunk. So if you have that bamboo stake there, they want to grow away from that stake so they can get sunlight all the way around. So bamboo stakes are great at certain and specific phases in the process when you're topping out and, you know, making sure you have nice straight leaders. But um, we give them the shake test. So we cut stakes off in the field before we buy the trees and physically yeah. shake them to see if they not only stand up, but if they can handle that back and forth movement. Yeah. So if you've got those trees and, the, and you planted them already and they're leaning over really bad, I would just prune them heavy um, at the top. They'll flush back out, um, but that way at least they'll stand up straight. Uh-huh. Yeah, great. We've got another question over the Internet here. Can you talk a bit about how you find out from a nursery what the previous life of a container tree was like? Um, yes. I think that um, some nurseries we've found, they like to propagate their own liners because they can save a couple bucks and keep everything local to what they're doing. Um, and those nurseries, you can ask them a lot of specific questions, and they may even want to show you their liners because they're proud of what they're doing. Um, but otherwise, you know, I ask nurserymen directly, and a lot of times those trees will have tags on them that show where the liners came from and 
um, you know, what year they were planted or when they were transplanted. And if they don't have a tag on them, you need to ask the nurseryman. And he really should tell you because if he doesn't want to tell you or he doesn't know, it, it, it might mean that um, – it might mean it's not a good idea to buy those trees because if you can't track back the history, you don't know where they were started, and you don't know what the seed source was, and, you know, there's really a lot of questions that come out of that that really should be answered. So if they can't provide that information or aren't readily providing it, you should really consider who you're doing business with because those are very basic and simple questions. It's like, you know, buying a car that's changed hands a couple times. You want to know where it's been, and if nobody can tell you, you got to wonder what happened along the way that you don't know. All right. Do we have any other questions on the line? Yes, we have our next question from Matt Churches. The line is now open. Hey, Barrett. Um, how you doing? I'm well, Matt. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, you too. Um, the the workshop you're talking about with all the nurserymen grading the different trees, uh, who put that on? And where, I mean, where, could we find something like that in our region? And if not, could we? Where could we get the materials to maybe put uh, some sort of a workshop like that on? Yeah, I th um, you know, we were fortunate that, you know, we spend a lot of time out at J. Frank Schmidt out in Oregon, and they're one of the largest tree growers in the country, and, you know, they are really invested in educating, you know, the consumer because um, it benefits them so that people buy the best trees, but also that, you know, they're really invested in the long-term canopy of our country. So, um Talking to them, you know, I think uh, Nancy Buley handles a lot of their communications. You could call her directly to talk about that. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's up to the to that liner grower to really want to demonstrate and show the value of using their liner. So um, I think talking to, you know, whatever local liner grower that, that you have, I think you're down by you. I think for this Keeling may be the closest one. Um, but asking somebody to set up that demo because you really want to understand what their trees look like before they go out to the finish grower. Um, so I would recommend calling them directly to ask that. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. There's been a lot of good questions. Uh, and if folks have more, I'm just going to ask you to hold them uh, till the next question and answer session because I want to make sure that we give Greg a chance to tell us from his perspective about the topic. So thanks very much, Barrett. And Thank I'm you. excited now to introduce Greg Page, who joined the Bartlett ranks as Arboretum Curator at the Bartlett Research Laboratory in Charlotte, North Carolina, in 2005. Greg's career in public horticulture has spanned 20 years. Previous to Bartlett, he was at Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Belmont, North Carolina, and at the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. He also worked at the Biltmore State in Asheville, North Carolina, the Holden Arboretum outside Cleveland, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, and as well as... Uh, tours of duty in the landscape maintenance world, the nursery trade, as a horticulturist at Cemetery. Greg, let's Hello. get you started. All right. Um, very happy to be here, and it looks like my slides are – there we go. I'm going to start at the beginning instead of the end. I'm going to try to um, kind of echo and, and uh, reinforce some of the things that, that Barrett uh, – pointed out um, from a horticulture or arboriculture tree finding perspective, we're kind of on the on the same page with the types of things that we look for, um, the types of things that we recommend to people, and um, I'll, I'll go ahead and cover some of those things as well. And, um, you know, the most important thing to, to think about and, and have in mind from, from the very start of, of this process is to, is, is to think about where this tree is going to end up, um, selecting the right plant for the right spot, you know, looking long-term down the road uh, as, in terms of how big that's going to get, the types of uh, design characteristics that you want to get out of that plant, how it's going to survive in an urban environment, all those things are the most important thing to, to think about before you make that investment of, of purchasing any, any kind of plant, tree, shrub, or, or otherwise. And, and where, do you, where do you shop? Um, you know, there's a gazillion sources out there, and, you know, the, the, the basic guidelines that I like to tell people and, and the things that I like to preach are, you know, first and foremost, quality. You, you want to spend that investment, um, that money, on a good quality plant. You want to buy from a, a nursery source that has a good selection of things. 
um, you know, different sizes. Uh, diversity is very, very important in, in all matters of life, and in particular with, with plant material. You want things that are going to be adaptable, things that are going to do well in, in urban environments. So diversity is very important. Um, knowledge. You don't, you know, you want to buy from people that know what they're selling. Um, they they know where the liner sources came from. They know what the ultimate growing characteristics of those plants, what they're going to do. Um, you know, if they don't have something that you're specifically asking for, they might have a substitute. So knowledge is is very important. And of course, price is an important thing, and, and particularly now with with the state of the economy. Um, and, and just to echo and, and uh, cover something that was brought up in one of the questions, you know, right now is actually a really good time to buy plants because nursery folk are, are, are having a tough time mo moving plant material, so there's lots of good deals on plants right now. So uh, price is very important, but um, and, and I'll cover this a little bit more later on, you, you definitely get what you pay for when you're, you're buying plants. And I mentioned there's, there's sources all over the place. Um, and, and I like to tell people to, to think globally and, and act locally. You know, find good sources of plant materials that are, are close to home and, and champion those people. Um, you know, if they're good quality plants, tell people that you work with about them. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in networking and working with other people. If I find a, a particular good nursery that I work with, I'll tell people about it because it, it behooves me to, to keep them in business because I can continue to buy plants from them. And it's worth preaching uh, that there are these good people out there. So, so look for good sources close by. And, and I do that here, and if I can't find a, a particular thing, I'll, I'll go outside another circle and, and continue to work. But there's some really, really good ones out there, um, and it, it, it behooves you to, to kind of keep those people in business and, and selling good quality plants. And if you find one that works for you, tell people about it. In terms of resources to track down some plants, there's, there's a ton of them out there. These are just two books that I ran across. We have a research scientist in New Jersey, and you know, after the, the fifth straight email of where can I find this, this plant in New Jersey, um, I, I tracked down these two books. And uh, basic stuff, um, you know, nurseries come and go, but it's, it's one source of, of where to find some good quality plants in, in your neck of the woods. Um, there's a website that used to be, um, it's part of the University of Minnesota Libraries, it's called Plant Information Online. Um, if you do a Google search and punch that in, it'll, it'll pop right up. Um, it used to be a subscription, now it's free. It's a great resource for uh, any type of plant that you're looking for. You can, you can type in through multiple fields certain types of plants that you're looking for, and it'll show you all the ones that it has in, in their database. You know, it, it, it behooves us, if, if you can, at all possible, to visit these places that you're buying plants from. You know, I, I, you can't really get a good feel until you've got your feet on the ground, you're, you're putting your hand in the soil, you're seeing what their equipment looks like, you're, you're meeting the, the, the nursery folk live and in person, um, you know, going to the site, looking for all those characteristics that, that Barrett brought up. You know, looking at the quality of, of plants such as these, you know, that's a, that's a tempting bargain to, to most penny pinchers, but, you know, it doesn't look at the best quality stuff in the world. You know, this was a, a four for $10. That's a, that's a great bargain, but, you know, you get what you pay for in, in the plant world. Um, the quality may not be there. The containers are, you know, the plants are all lopsided. This actual these these pallets are under an overhang, and Lord knows when they last got some some water applied to them. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Looking at these plants, uh, 
we talked earlier about that the head of a plant being too big. Well, this is a good example of that. These are some rat repairs that we bought for uh, an experiment, and we actually wanted plants that were severely root-bound and in bad shape. So this, there's a particular nursery close to me that whenever we want to do bad things to, to plants, we go straight to them because we know exactly what we're going to get. Um, you know, these plants were stepped up from liners into a gallon and a three-gallon, and uh, not enough root mass for the ultimate head of that plant. And, um, you know, these things weren't destined to live very long, but if you were buying these for the investment of a, a home landscape, a street tree planting or whatever, you know, you need to run in the other direction because this, this just reeks of, of bad care uh, from the liner all the way up to the finished product here. And I very much prescribe to the to kick the tires, the uh, look what's under the hood concept of, of buying plants. Um, I make nurserymen very nervous whenever I, I'm on the property because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look with all eyes open at what's going on with that plant's root system because everything starts there. I'll take the plant out of the pot. I'll look for a nice, healthy, white root system. I, I look for girdling roots, for J roots. I'll look for the root flare of that plant. I'll even smell the soil to see if it's uh, aerobic. Um, you know, I'll look at the fertilizer that they're using, if, if, if there even is fertilizer present. Um, I've even been to nurseries where they're, they're reusing their containers. Um, but, you know, take that plant out, pop the hood, look at all aspects of it, look for any kind of disease activity, look for insects. Um, I visited a nursery last week that there was just as much um, deer browse on the plants as, as you know, they were, that's how the plants were getting pruned. Um, all important things to look for. Take the tires and, and take the plants out of the container and, and see what's going on with that root system. And look at the foliage of the plant. You know, that's going to tell a lot, too. These, these plants were uh, devoid of any kind of fertilizer. Um, the, the willow on the far left had a lot of dead branching in it. Um, you know, there's some nutrient deficiencies going on here. And, and from the beginning of an investment of purchasing a plant, you don't want to start off with those types of things going on. Those, those types of stresses are only going to decrease the life of the plant once you get it out into the, the cold, hard, real world. This is a bad scenario if you're going to make that investment for a large B&B &B tree that, you know, they're getting overwatered, that soil is anaerobic, there's all kinds of diseases swimming around in there, the root system isn't drying out. It's just going to stress those plants out, you know, turn and, and go to another place. And a, a shot of a, of a good nursery that I work with here in North Carolina, um, you know, good state-of-the-art houses that are all computer-operated, a good diverse uh, range of plant material. You see down at the bottom of the shot, they've got this fabric that once they take the houses down, if it's going to be some cold temperatures, they can protect their investment and your investment ultimately on protecting those plants from that cold. So they're going the extra step to ensure they've got a good product. You know, you could line a transit in this nursery. The plants are in such straight lines. You know, weeds on the mats, uh, no fertilizer spillage, there's no dead leaves good quality plant material from the, from the start, you know, and diversity, a good diversity uh, amount of things, giving you lots of selections to choose from, uh, things that are pruned correctly, things that need to be in the shade or kept in the shade so they're not being stressed out, uh, things are being watered correctly, it's, you know, no weeds, just a good quality operation, things being pruned correctly. You see that they're getting fertilizer, not too much. All kinds of things to look for. Barrett spoke about this uh, resource. It's a great one. We've done some work with, with Dr. Gilman here at the, at the lab. Uh, strongly encourage folks to, to pick up this book. It's just a really good resource. And other ways to, to get involved and to find out about good quality plants, uh, just going to trade shows and, and getting involved in professional groups, uh, PGMS, the ASLA, um, just getting in that stream of, of information and, and finding out about where these things are occurring and, you know, attending, attending them as you can, participating in, in things like this webinar, 
all those things are going to help us track down good sources of plants and, and learn the right things to do to protect that investment. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I kind of blew through those, and I, I guess we're open to questions now. Yeah, we are. Thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, Tom, if we could open the lines for questions. Thank you. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by pressing star then one on the phone. One moment, please. And again, I'll remind folks that you can ask your questions online uh, through that Q&A tab. While we're waiting for folks to formulate their questions or to, to log in, I've got a few for you. Um, Greg, those are some really great resources that you presented in there. I was wondering, we've had uh, some questions, if you could just, uh, again, one more time tell people about the resources for the, I think there were two books you showed about uh, locating uh, you know, the best nurseries in your area or where to where to find good plants, um, maybe one that was a website for locating a specific kind of tree? Sure. Um, it's, it's called Plant Information Online, and the University of Minnesota Libraries um, organized it. It used to be a subscription site. Now it's, uh, it's available free. Um, if you just log on to the site, they've got multiple fields where you can find out if you're looking for bare root trees, if you're looking for container trees, if you're looking for a certain genus or a certain cultivar, you can enter all those things and um, it'll show you retail sources, it'll show you wholesale sources. Then you can scroll through those and find ones that are, are close to home, making it easier to, to visit and or pick up plants. Um, the books I showed, I can scroll back to that slide. Um, the only negative thing I can say about those books is you know, nurseries come and go, um, and I'm not sure how updated those uh, those two, two two books are. I've seen them for most states um, in the country, and one was for New England, the other was for New York and New Jersey. Um, Rua Donnelly. They're both good books. They've got a lot of good information, and um, you know, even even something as simple as you know, looking for some nursery trade shows in, in the area that you live in and attending those uh, where, where people can present their wares. You can meet the nurserymen. You can pick up catalogs. You can pick up availability lists. And in some cases, they'll have plants there. You can kind of look at their quality. And one of the biggest things I, I try to tell people to take advantage of is to network with other people in the trade. Um, I'm a big believer in that. You know, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. If you found a good source for oaks or maples or whatever, uh, tell people about it and uh, champion those nurseries so that they're staying in business, they're continuing to develop those relationships with other people. Um, J. Frank Schmidt is great for that. They're heavily involved in the customer base, in the research base, um, on all levels, and they're just great people to work with. And if they don't have something, they'll they'll tell you someplace else to go. So just uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to call nurseries up and, and say, you know, I'm, I want to come by and, and check out your, your products. And if they are hesitant to do that, then go someplace else. Great. Do we have any questions on the phone? At this point, we have no questions in queue. Excellent, because I've got more. <laughs> so uh, one question in from someone who says, I buy about 50 trees every year of many different species and cultivars to replace street trees that have died throughout my city. How do I test for quality when each tree is a different species? Is it really beneficial to take apart a root ball of one tree if the others potentially had a different history since they're different species? Do you have any, uh, uh, any suggestions for this question? Sure, sure. Absolutely, there are species differences in, in the way things grow, in the time of the year that you plant, and the way their root systems develop. But nurseries that are growing good quality plants start with good liners. So Barrett's point of, of asking that important question is, is very valid and very important. Um, <clears throat> regardless of species, if, if they're starting from that point with a good quality plant, uh, that, that's a good first step. Um, if they're pruning things correctly, if they're, you know, planting at correct depths out in, out in the field, planting at correct spacing out in the field, all, all those types of things are, are important. And that's going to, you know, that doesn't matter from a species perspective. If you're buying diverse trees from, from a source, um, all those good practices will fall in a line regardless of, of what, that, what that species is. 
And, you know, it, it's important to, to plant uh, diverse plant material. Um, you know, you look at the American elm and uh, the sorid path, but it went down because of the, the monoculture. So it, it, it behooves us to, to be diverse in, in things that we are planting. But if it's a good quality nursery, uh, they're going to be taking all those steps to be sure that that in investment from their standpoint all the way through to the end and marketing what they have um, is going to be consistent regardless of the species. Thanks. This is a question that I think will be relevant for uh, lots of folks, a lot of ACT members, either are uh, government organizations or, or work with them, and a lot of folks on this webcast uh, are either state or city employees. Uh, there are often restrictions by uh, city laws or state laws uh, that people have to get quotes from different nurseries and select the lowest price before purchasing plant material, um, although usually there's the exception that folks can include restrictions in their RFP to help avoid poor quality providers. Mm -hmm. Can you recommend uh, some requirements uh, to put in the request for prices that would help ensure good quality stock, uh, maybe beyond the ANLA standards for nursery stock? Sure. Um, one thing that I've done in the past, and this, this also helps if it's a nursery that you can't visit, is uh, you know to get some plants delivered as almost like a sample pack and, you know, pay, pay for that initial first cost and, and use those trees as, as an autopsy. Um, take them apart, rip the root ball off and look at that root system, uh, look at the structure of the trees and see that they've been pruned correctly and are, are developing in a, in a good manner. You know, look for any type of disease or insect issue. And if you like what you see, um, you know, then you can proceed further with a, with a bigger order. That, that might be one way to, to address that. Um, other than that, um, and Barrett, you may speak to it because you deal with it a little bit more than I do. Um, you know, I think part of part of the cost uh, factor is, you know, yes, you may find a, a tree uh, at a lower cost, but do you want to take the time to get those delivered, unload them, plant them, mulch them, initially take care of them? when they're not a good quality tree and the chance of them failing is, is going to be higher than if you just spend an extra, you know, $100 per tree or $5 per tree or, or whatever and made that initial investment in a, in a better quality plant. Um, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough that you, you definitely get what you pay for when it, when it comes to the plant material. And I think those types of stipulations, we need to be better about educating um, the decision makers, the, the purse string holders, uh, about those types of things. Yeah, and luckily we're, you know, this is Barrett again, we're, we're fortunate that we are using private monies for our tree procurement, so we don't necessarily have to go through such a big RFP process. But I've talked to a lot of people who have to do that and go through that process, and I think, you know, again, like you said, being able to check all those things in advance and, you know, restrictions, you know, could be about, um, you know, where the trees came from, how old they are, you know, asking questions about the liners. You know, I think if you could specify a couple of different liner growers that you knew were quality, chances are that, you know, those people are also quality finished growers. Um, but I, I think that, you know, contacting um, other municipalities, you know, and using some of these circles, whether it's ACT or um, SMA or, you know, a lot of these great, you know, um, arborist institutions, ISA, any of these, they certainly have tons of references on all those different things. We'd we'll be happy to share them because they're just as interested in everybody buying good trees um, as you are because it improves our, our country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Great. Tom, do we have any other questions on the line? At this point, we still have no questions in queue. Perfect, because <laughs> we're, we're going to keep trucking. Uh, another question here is um, about the economy. And for economy's sake, do you see bare root planting as a viable choice for planting? Bare root planting is a, is a, good, a good choice for, for lots of reasons. Um, you know, you get that plant's whole root system. You can see any developmental issues. You can see that root flare. Um, you can get a pretty good sized tree for not a whole lot of money and um, plant it at the correct depth uh, and, and be off to the races with a, a good healthy investment and a good healthy tree. The only downside with bare root uh, trees are there aren't a lot of sources. There's more now than there were five years ago and a lot more people are going that route. Um, and the, the most important factor of bare root trees is, is the shelf life. 
um, you can't transport that around uh, for, a, for a, a great length of time because the root system is exposed. Um, a, a good example, we planted a, a 1,500 tree research plot when I first started here. Uh, the day the tree is delivered from J. Frank Schmidt in Oregon, it was 45 degrees. The next day it went up to uh, 75, and we had to really scramble to get those things in the ground. So that's, that's, that's a huge issue with, with the bare root plants is, is shelf life. They've got to be planted relatively quickly. Um, but, you know, the benefits are they're easy to handle. You get a pretty good-sized tree for not a lot of money. You can really see that, that root system, and, and you're going to have a, a much better success rate than, than with other sources. I know a lot of municipalities are, are going that way. Um, and, and like I said, there, there's more people going in the direction of, of growing bare root trees now than there, there were five years ago. Okay. Do you have uh, any experience with wire baskets that you want to share? Experience with what? Wire baskets. Oh, boy. I could talk for hours about that. Um, we like to, to tell people uh, the wire basket on a, on a bald and burlap tree, um, it's a great way to transplant those, those plants. It holds the, the root ball together. Um, we've done some, some research here and in other places I've worked at where if, if you don't fold that basket back at planting, um, it, it may inhibit root growth. It could girdle the, the main stem of the tree. I, I've seen trees planted in the landscape where the burlap and the twine or the strapping and the, the folds of the, of the basket were never put, put back, and all that stuff is growing into the trunk of the tree. So it's very important to remove as much of that as you can. And we try to tell people if it doesn't compromise the integrity of that root ball, try to get that whole basket off that tree if, if at all possible. Um, there's also been some research and a lot of talk um, when, when I was in college you know, you handle that that B and B root ball like a Fabergé egg. Um, we've done some stuff with Bonnie Appleton from Virginia Tech, where we've taken, you know, a two-inch caliper bald and burlap tree, raised it up four feet with a forklift, and dropped it on the ground to, to basically bare root the tree. So that's kind of new uh, and upcoming technology. Um, you know, the, the take-home message with, with that basket if you're doing a bare, a, a bald and burlap tree is, at minimum, pull those ears back so that they're never going to inflict with that uh, root flare of the tree as it develops. If you can take the top part of that basket off uh, with a good pair of bolt cutters, do that um, without damaging the integrity and loosening that, that root ball up too terribly. Um, it, it's, it's pretty easy to do once you've kind of, uh, once you've kind of learned how to do it. Great. And maybe, uh, maybe the final question, you guys could uh, talk a little bit about how to work with the nursery industry in your area or with the nurseries in your area to uh, perhaps help them change their practices if they're, if they're not up to your standards right now. Or what's, what's perhaps too, too much to ask? Uh, what's reasonable to ask a nursery? Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Greg. I mean, right now is, is a, a good time to, to work with nurseries because they're they're doing their best to, to sell trees. And um, we've had people here at our lab where we've talked about root flare issues, where we've talked about root pruning, where we've talked about staking, where we've talked about stepping things up from from liners. Um, that that exchange of, of friendly information is, is healthy for for both individuals. Um, and, you know, as Barrett said multiple times, you know, the good quality plant material or good quality nurserymen are, are doing those things already, and they're open to ideas. They're open to that dialogue. And, and as you develop relationships with them, that, that, should, only, that should only increase. Um, you know, anything from cuttings to, you know, all the way up to a finished product, to structural pruning, you know, all those, all those things are important. And, you know, the good quality nursery folk are, are, are staying up to speed on, on those types of things. You know, uh, there are short a slide of, of the air pots. There, there aren't a lot of people using those now. More, more are, but those are continuing to, to develop. Um, the whole organic uh, market in terms of a potting material, moving away from peat moss, using more sustainable products, all that stuff is, is being done by more and more nursery people because they're listening to customers, they're listening to, to the folks in the trade. So. You know, it just you know, it's it's a relationship like any relationship. Um, 
you know, open dialogue on, on both ends is important. And if you're working with somebody that is, is closed-minded, um, negative, and, and doesn't want to change the way they do things, you know, that's not somebody that I want to be around personally or professionally. Right, and I'll echo that, Greg, and I think the listening part is important. I mean, we're fortunate that we were able to pick some fabulous vendors that we work with, and I regularly hear from them, you know, tell us how you want it. You're the customer. We're happy to do it. If that's what you need in your region and that's what you need for your project, we want to sell you the right tree. So that open attitude and interest um, is a great sign of, a, you know, a partnership. I think also, you know, educating yourself as much as possible. You may, or depending on what program you work in, we're fortunate we get to spend a lot of time traveling to different conferences and, you know, going to different speakers and, you know, really learning a lot of things that maybe a nurseryman doesn't get to do. So he may be excited to hear you say, here are a couple new things that I learned and here's a reference material. You should check it out. So I think just that communication and, and listening on their part um, is important. Um, but at the end of the day, you're the one with the money and you're buying the tree, so they should do what you want them to do. All right. Thanks so much, guys. I think we're going to close it up now. If folks have other questions, you can definitely feel free to email them to me, uh, and I'm sure Greg and Bear would be happy to answer those. And just uh, uh, related to the conferences and the presentations that you were just mentioning, Barrett, I uh, want everyone to know that ACT will be hosting a bare root trees planting uh, volunteer project on Sunday, November 7th, the day before ACT's meeting at the Philadelphia Partners in Community Forestry Conference. So everyone is welcome to attend that and come out to the planting to see some of this in action. We'll be uh, working with experts from Pennsylvania Horticulture Society and Delaware Center for Horticulture to show us their, their tricks of the trade and their expertise. Uh, so I want to thank Beg and Barrett their presentations and this recorded session and the resource list about related topics all be available in about one week and uh, we will email everyone to complete this brief survey that you see up there on the screen right now. We'll send you all those resources. So <clears throat> we'd really appreciate it if you can take uh, a minute or two to fill out this very quick survey. It helps us to improve our programming and deliver uh, better pro programs to you guys. Our next webcast session is the second in this series. It's Species Selection Part 2, Seasonal Landscaping, and that will take place on August 5th. I want to say a big thanks to Greg and Barrett for presenting today, and also to everyone who attended, and to our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, though. Thank you. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation.